Well, good morning, saints. Good morning, morning sinners. We're all here this morning. I'm so glad. And some new, new saints and sinners I see out there in the, in the congregation, too. It's good to have you this morning. On this third Sunday of Advent, the lectionary plunks us down right in the middle of Matthew's gospel, uh, so far away from the story of Jesus' impending birth. Uh, with all the angels and Mary and Joseph and the shepherds and the cattle lowing off someplace. And it's helpful for us to remember that the first two Sundays in our Advent preparation have been focusing upon the second coming of Christ, the parousia or the eschaton, if you want the 50 cent word, when Jesus is going to come again at the culmination of time and redeem heaven, earth, the cosmos. And then the last two Sundays in Advent begin to zero in on Jesus' initial coming as he is born to this woman, this young girl named Mary. In particular, the third Sunday of Advent today is known as Joy Sunday. And the scripture passage that we have helps us to focus on John the Baptist and how he is the one who prepares the way for the coming Messiah. Every year on the third Sunday, John is the focus of the text. So, as you listen to our text this morning, I want you to keep in mind that John the Baptist and Jesus are blood cousins. We we kind of forget that sometimes. They're cousins. And they have known each other nice 30 years. Now, John, he passionately preached how he was preparing the people of Israel for the coming Messiah and for the upcoming judgment of God and the judgment the Messiah would bring. As John puts it delicately in Matthew 3, 10, he says, the axe is already at the foot of the tree. And every tree that does not bear fruit, I'm going to cut down and will be thrown into the fire in judgment. Hey, that's, that's an upper. Good news, John. Thanks. You know, we might say John would not be the best initial guest to a Christmas party. He's a little bit of a Debbie Downer. Um, his, his message is hard. John's message is focused. It's very, he has a very narrow understanding of what Messiah would and should be doing. For John the Baptist, the Messiah was this all-powerful rally the Jewish people back as a holy, precious, pietistic nation following the very law of Moses the law of God. And the Messiah was going to cast judgment and vengeance upon all of those people who didn't do that. Well, the last we hear from John in Matthew's Gospel is in Matthew 3. And today we hear again, first time we hear of John again in Matthew 11, verses 2 to 11. As you listen, I want you to see if you can hear and pick up a twinge for what I call, the lack of a better word, buyer's remorse on John's part. One gets the impression for for John the Baptist that the Messiah he is hearing about in in chapter, it talks about in chapter 3 of Matthew, was not fulfilling his expectations of what the Messiah should be doing. Listen, my friends, to the word of the Lord, Matthew chapter 11, verses 2 through 11. Listen to the word of the Lord. When John the Baptist heard in prison what the Messiah was doing, He sent word by his disciples and said to Jesus, Are you the one who is to come, or are we to wait for another? 
Jesus answered John's disciples, go. Tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight. The lame walk. The lepers are cleansed and restored to community. The deaf hear. The dead are raised. And the poor have the good news brought to them. And blessed is anyone who takes no offense at me. So, as John's disciples went away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds around him about John. What did you go out in the wilderness to look at? A reed shaken by the wind? What then did you go out to see? Someone dressed in soft flowing robes? Look, those who wear soft robes are in royal palaces. What then did you go out and see? A, a prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. You see, this is the one about whom it is written in Isaiah, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. Truly, I tell you, those born of women, no one has risen greater than John the Baptist. And yet... The very least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he is. My friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Expectations versus reality. Now, we all have expectations of certain things, don't we? You know that when you go to a nice restaurant, the expectation is you will get a good meal. Or there won't be a mouse on the floor. You know, you go to a car dealership, you expect that you're going to get hustled, and you prepare yourself for that. It's okay. It's part of the game. Expectations versus reality. You see, it's when we manufacture in our minds the way things are supposed to be or to turn out, and then what happens is those expectations aren't met. There's a mismatch. There's a gap between what we expect and what is really going on. It's like Clark Griswold and his family driving across the country excitedly waiting to go to Wally World. And when they arrive, they discover it's closed. Our story this morning is laced with misplaced and perceived expectations over against hard realities. Today's text sets you, sets up for you and me the subliminal question that we are asked to wrestle with from our text, which is this. What are our expectations of the coming Messiah? Who or what do we expect to see, visit, or meet on Christmas morning? First, there are John's expectations of Jesus. John has been arrested by King Herod because John has had the audacity to publicly call Herod out for sleeping with Herod's brother and sister. Go figure. Herod throws him into prison. He doesn't like to be talked about that way. So for John, his ministry has been checkmated. And all John the Baptist could do is languish in prison in hope that God would make good on his promises to separate the good wheat, insert repentant, contrite Jews, from the chaff, that is, unrepentant Jews and those Gentiles, and then burn the chaff in unquenchable fire that John talked about back in Matthew 3. Unfortunately, these were not the reports that John the Baptist was receiving back from his disciples about Jesus' ministry. 
Since the last time we saw John in Matthew 3, Jesus has been baptized. He has gone out into the wilderness, was tempted by Satan. And he was tempted to use his power and status as the Son of God to achieve earthly power and dominion. And in so many words, Jesus tells the devil, get a life. And then proceeds to lay out through chapters 5 through 7 these beautiful words that we call the Beatitudes. And they are a template for how the people of God are to live. The people of God are not to be pursuing earthly power, but indeed they are blessed when they are poor in spirit. They are blessed when they become weak. They are blessed when they are persecuted for righteousness' sake. This isn't adding up for John the Baptist. Furthermore, Jesus as Messiah was not um, confronting and hobnobbing with the political powers that be, trying to wrest power from them. You see, the Messiah was a political figure. He was supposed to regain control of Israel from the hands of those Gentiles. But on the contrary, in the first 12 chapters of Matthew's Gospel, Jesus instead is hanging out with the community's outcasts, the dejected ones. Instead of being face-to-face with King Herod and debating him in the palace, Jesus is moving in and among, out with the people in the countryside, in the backwaters of Palestine, with the poor, The sick, the diseased, the foreigners, those Gentiles, those prostitutes, those crooks, those tax collectors, you know, those people. He is living a Messiahship, Jesus is, of grace and inclusion, whereas John's was expecting a messiahship that would usher in a separate and exclusive group of pure people as compared to those sinful people. John's expectations are not being met with Jesus' ministry. So he sends his disciples to go see Jesus. The sea of Jesus, are you bona fide? Is Jesus really, really the one the Baptist is looking for? Or, Jesus, do we need to look for somebody else? You can almost hear a tinge of disappointment in John's question. Jesus just was simply not fulfilling the Baptist's expectation of Messiah. Are you the one or not, Jesus? Tell me now. Now, when Jesus is confronted with these questions, he could have thrown his cousin John under the bus. He could have said, what? Someone else? My goodness. Why don't you go telling John, who made you judge and jury of whether or not I'm the Messiah? But Jesus didn't do that. He takes John with John's own expectations and then reframes them for his cousin. He says, tell my cousin John what you yourselves see and hear that the blind receive their sight, the the lame are walking, those who have leprosy are cured and restored back to community, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, And poor souls are being evangelized with the good news. Now, what you and I miss with Jesus' response is that he is quoting prophetic scripture from Isaiah 35 that Dr. Maston read a moment ago and from Isaiah 61. Jesus is telling John's disciples to, to go back And tell John what they are personally, experientially encountering 
when they are around Jesus. Jesus wants them to go remind John, listen, because you expected me to do that, but God wants me to do this. My goal, John, God's goal, is to love people back into the kingdom and make the circle of fellowship even wider and larger. John, I know you had your expectations of me and what I was supposed to do, but John, quite frankly, your expectations of me, of God, are too small. My expectations include a greater, larger, more inclusive vision of what God's going to do, John. Go read Isaiah. Because that's what's happening. And yet John was, was, was not the only one who had expectations broken in our story. It seems that the crowds that came with John's disciples surrounding Jesus, it seems like they also had their own expectations of who and what John the Baptist should be. And Jesus addresses those rather frankly and to the point. In rapid fire succession, in just a few verses, Jesus addresses crowd, the crowd's expectations of John. What did y'all come out to see? A mealy mouthed, wimpy prophet and preacher? I mean, John is a spiritual giant. Did you come out? What did you come out to see? Did you expect to see a fashion show with a guy dressed as a traveling, fancy dressed evangelist? No. Did you, did you come out to see someone from the Old Testament, like the Old Testament prophets? Let me tell you, John is not only a prophet, but John the Baptist was prophesied about by those prophets. No one like him has ever been. But you know what? Even the least of the people of the kingdom of heaven, those poor, those crooks, those prostitutes, those tax collectors, the broken, the lame, the deaf, the dead, they (laughs) are greater than John in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is addressed their wrong expectations of his cousin John. It seems that everybody has their own opinion and expectation about the way things should be. You and I are really no different. We come to church and we pray at home with this image and expectation of a God who is and what God should be in dealing with those people, or the image that God should be in dealing with me. We we have our own expectations of Jesus and how He is to respond to my questions, your questions, my problems, your problems, my issues, your issues. We have our own expectations of who is really worthy of God's love and who's not. We have our own expectations of how our religious leaders are supposed to act as a preacher, how they're supposed to dress, how they're supposed to behave. We are human beings, and we bring our emotional, social, cultural, and spiritual-infused expectations and baggage with us, and we place those expectations on God. We bring our own personal histories and throw them on God and create our expectation of who God should be and do based on our own past. To bear on how we see Jesus. How we see God. And what we expect the Almighty, the one who is, who was, and is to come, is to work in our lives. Beloved, think for a moment. What are your expectations of Jesus in your life? 
What are your expectations of Jesus? What do you expect God to do for you? What are the expectations you place upon your spiritual leaders? Is it about, what what are your expectations about Christmas Day? Do you have any? Is it about gifts? Is that the big deal? About being with family and friends? Do you have any expectation for new life and new birth? Not only in the child, but in your own life? What? are your and my expectations as we make our way through advent i invite us to do a couple of things first ask yourself if you have any any expectations that anything is going to happen christmas day and if not why Next, I want you to ask yourself if the expectations you have placed upon Jesus, upon God, are realistic. Or do they reflect your own emotional, cultural, political agenda? If so, does that agenda either Is it either in line with or is it contrary to the values of God expressed in Matthew 5 and the Beatitudes? Finally, ask yourself if my expectations of Jesus are really too small like John the Baptist's were. If they are, then I want you to dream what is the biggest, most fantastic image of Jesus and expectations of Jesus can you place upon them? And are you willing to play a part in achieving those expectations? Today is Joy Sunday, my friends, because today we celebrate that our expectations of God are so much smaller than they should be And Jesus is asking us to expect more out of him than we ever imagined. That is cause for joy. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all of God's people said, let's pray this prayer that one of the greatest theologians of the last 150 years wrote in a a book called 50 Prayers, Karl Barth. He wrote this for Advent. Pray with me. Lord, may you now let this year once more approach the light, the celebration, and the joy of Christmas Day that brings us face to face with the greatest thing there is, your love with which you so loved the world you gave your only Son, so that all of us may believe in Him, and therefore not be lost, but have eternal life. Amen. Let's sing with joy.